Perfect. Let's start this. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining for the Digit 2.3 and 2.4 release webinar. I know we did not do the 2.3 one in April, so there will be a lot to unpack in this session. And I hope that all the information that you see here in terms of the demos that you see and even the product enhancement are useful to the work that we are uh, you are doing on a daily basis. At the same time, we'll also talk about the new missions that we have launched and the work that we are doing as part of new missions. So a lot of new developments on the eGov side, and this will be an exciting webinar for a lot of you. So I'll just talk about the agenda for today. Uh, so I am doing the introduction post which uh, Jojo will take you through the product roadmap. He will talk about uh, the core areas that we are going to tackle as part of each mission in the product. Then we'll take you through FSM and each alarm, both, both of which are new modules as part of the 2.3 and 2.4 release on digit. And the good thing about each alarm is it's again, one of the modules which was contributed back by a partner. So Bell had contributed the module back and we are seeing a lot of co-creation in the market with the partners. So you're going to be hearing a lot about the ways in which we are engaging market participants better. Then we'll be taking you through the secure coding guidelines and the QA automation pieces. Uh, which are on the platform enhancement sides. And we are going to be doing a lot more sessions on platform enhancements as we are streamlining a lot of processes, including how we are doing contributions on digit, which we will take you through in the next uh, release. So this is the agenda for today. And given that we have a lot of lot to unpack, I'll give it off directly to Jojo to take us through the session. Thanks, Ajay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to spend five minutes just running you through the highlights of the product roadmap themes, uh, you know, that we have uh, that we have for the year, and within that we'll try and capture what's covered in um, in the in the recent two releases, 2.3 and 2.4. So broadly, as you can see on your screen, we are, you know, we've we've kind of classified our roadmap in three broad missions, uh, and everything that we're doing is is done within these three missions. So one is the urban mission, um, you know, which has the current reference products that most of you are, are aware of, um, you know, property tax, trade license, PGR, et cetera, uh, which get covered in the urban mission. I'll spend some time talking about that as well. The next one is on, on public finance management, which is a new mission that eGov has just started off. I'll give you a very brief overview of what we're looking at um, in, the, in the public finance space, how we're looking at it. And, uh, and a little bit about iFix, which is the platform. And the third mission that is, uh, that's again well underway is on sanitation, uh, where we've got our first exemplar, um, almost about to go live in, uh, in Odisha. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Can we have the next slide, please? Great. So uh, yeah, next slide, uh, Ajay. Okay, so on the on the urban mission, as Digit continues to get adopted by states and urban local bodies, a lot of it is in good collaboration with our partners. Uh, there is a lot of improvement in government's ability to go and deliver these services. While there is no denying that a technology platform like Digit helps address capacity constraints at the government's end, we are cognizant of the fact that a lot needs to be done to realize the full potential of this platform and deepen the impact of this transformation to citizens. As a, as a result, a key theme for this year is to focus on adoption. We're gonna be actively working with states and our partners on interventions to ensure that citizens benefit from these efforts. Some of these are enabling features within the platform that make it easier for citizens to use digital services or extending services like paying property tax, water charges, filing for a grievance, et cetera, to channels that citizens are most comfortable with, for instance, on WhatsApp. Or it could be things like contextual help on screen. So that's, you know, people find it easier to navigate. There's also a new UI in the works, um, which, we, uh, you know, a lot of the partners are, uh, are already aware of. Uh, there's open dashboards, so, you know, so people have access to data. So there's a lot of focus, as you can see, on ease of access, simplification, and nudges that drive adoption. Within the urban mission itself, there's also the work that is happening on enabling the Center for Digital Governance, CDG, um, that a lot of you are aware of. 
as this initiative takes off, we need to ensure that we put in place mechanisms that help it succeed. This includes setting up a demo environment, uh, product toolkits, a lot of work around standardization, et cetera. So this is an exciting event that institutionalizes what began as an urban mission with the center. Uh, more updates on this will be available on our website, so do look out for that. And finally, a lot of reference products on Bidget are reaching a fair degree of maturity, and a lot of enhancements and extensions are being driven by our partners. I'm happy to note that some partners are contributing back to the core platform, and my colleague Ajit will take you through one such contribution a little later. Can we have the next slide, please? The next one I'd like to spend you know, a minute talking about, it's early days for us, uh, is on public finance management. We can move on to the next slide. So th there are a number of areas where the Indian state machinery faces issues with respect to execution of government policies and where India's political leadership finds it difficult to deliver on its policy priorities. This constrained capacity of the state, primarily in, in performance and expenditure management, manifests itself in many ways. Right, uh, and, and all of us are witness to this. This is delays in, in citizens receiving public services or social benefits for which they are eligible. Vendors and contractual staff do not receive their payments and consequently curtail their services. Funds to implementing agencies are often delayed and finance and, and line departments are unable to effectively monitor and enforce high fidelity implementation on the ground. Uh, to address these challenges, it's a big problem. To address these challenges, um, we're, we started working on, um, we've taken a platform approach to solving some of the problems that we've seen in, uh, in public finance management. And, uh, and it's called IFIX, which is India Fiscal Information Exchange Platform. So more on, so it's very, very early days for us right now. We're doing our first um, POC and an exemplar of this uh, with the government of Punjab. More on this again, uh, hopefully at the end of this quarter. Uh, but this is again an exciting space to work with. We're working with partners already on this. Uh, so would urge you all to keep a track of what's happening on IFIX. Uh, the next one is on sanitation. That's our third mission. The next slide, please. So sanitation again, um, you know, it's a it, it's a huge it's a huge problem um, across the country. It's you know, uh, for example, you know, across across your waste management chains whether it is on fecal sludge management, uh, solid waste management, et cetera. We are doing a first exemplar of this in fecal sludge management, and that's with the state of Odisha, the next slide. And what we've done is we are co-creating the entire sanitation platform, um, working with, with partners across a range of domains, right? So we're working with knowledge partners like your Wash Institute, SEPT, IHS, Etc. cetera, um, we're working with the technology partners. In fact, we just had a discussion with, with Transfer. We, we are in touch with ESRI. Um, in the case of Odisha, where this is getting implemented right now and the pilot is about to get rolled out in a week or so, uh, we're working with EY. And of course, there is, you know, uh, our funders are, are, are hugely uh, supportive of this initiative. I'm going to give you a very broad overview of how we're seeing the sanitation value chain. So this is essentially, uh, imagine this, and, 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 and why we're looking at this as a platform approach. While we are, looking, while we are starting off with FSM, uh, we believe us, you know, the same platform would be able to be able to support other waste management as well. So if you look at the entire waste management spectrum, it starts off from you know, your basic generation of waste to containment units, in this case, a toilet or a septic tank. Then there is a transport part of it where, you know, where where sludge is collected, transported onto a vehicle, uh, and is taken to a treatment plant where it's processed and disposed. Now, a very similar ab abstraction can be applied to, um, to solid waste management as well, right? There's a source at which waste is generated. It's, you know, it's collected, it's transported, it's treated, and then it's either reused or disposed. Um, and, and that's our approach to, uh, to waste management for now. But for now, we're going to be talking about FSM. Um, in V1, for example, we're looking at, um, at basically operationalizing the entire system in the pilots that we have in the three ULBs. Um, and in V2, we look at a lot more automation. I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, uh, Shankar, who's going to take you through in a lot more detail on what we're doing on FSM in Odisha and give you a demo as well. Shankar, over to you. 
Yeah, thanks, Jojo. Ajay, can you move on to the next slide? Yeah. So uh, this is the process flow diagram of the FSM non-network sanitation process. Uh, so before jumping into, I just like to have viewers on what is a network sanitation and what is a non-network sanitation. So network sanitation is is basically your sewage networks. So where uh, all the sewage that is generated from the households or commercial entities travel through your pipeline and it reaches to your uh, sewage treatment plant without any human intervention. Or uh, so that is called as a network sanitation process. And non-network sanitation process that all the septage is collected in the household septic tanks are like removed using the vehicle, and then that vehicle transport the septage to uh, open fields or septage treatment plants or whatever uh, ways and means it, it can be discarded. So that's a non-network sanitation process. As Jojo was saying, that the market is huge because uh, more than 70% of India's sanitation is depending on the non-network sanitation process. And uh, also as an outcome of such Bharat mission, lot of, lots and lots of toilets have been built across the nation. So now there is a humongous uh, market for uh, ex exactly the non-network sanitation process where the uh, system cannot be invested with huge amount of money for a uh, network sanitation. So that's the reason non-network sanitation is very important at this point of time. And uh, as you can see, the process starts from households, from a toilet. It goes to a containment structure, which is nothing but a septic tank of different natures and types. From those septic tanks, it is uh, discarded using a septic using a vehicle, uh, which is operated either operated by a private entity or by a government entity. So this truck, uh, ideally, it has to reach to a septic treatment plant where the waste is getting treated. Uh, and post that, the treated waste is either uh, used as a manure in the farmlands or the treated waste water is like discarded to the water bodies. So this is the entire process chain for non network sanitation process. So now, uh, Ajay, can you move on to the next slide, please? So we'll quickly take a look at the list of features that we have developed in the FSM version one, Ficker Switch Management version one. So we have four stakeholders here. One is the citizen, uh, you'll be employee, desledging operator, and the FSTP operator. So citizen, usually we, we are giving access for the citizen to lodge the request online. It can be used uh, used by it can be done by a mobile phone, tablet, desktop, or even a citizen can call to the, make a call to the call center and ask for the service. Or you can directly walk into the ULB or citizen service counters and ask for the service. And uh, citizen should be able to pay the uh, um, pay the amount for the service online. Also, you can check the status of the request online and provide feedback. Post the service is done. And for the ULB employee, over a period of time when data gets generated, the ULB will obviously have the database of the number of safety time that is available in the city, uh, which eventually uh, uh, most of the cities doesn't have this info right now. And uh, also identify the DSO for the service request. So you'll be employed would be able to assign a particular request that is getting raised from a citizen to a desligium operator who is registered with the urban local body as a person who can do this particular activity of transporting the sludge from the household to the uh, FSTP plant. And uh, also we have dashboards and reports for the ULB employee. And when, when, when it comes to the registered dislodging operator, either it can be the operator can be urban local body itself, or it can be a private operator who is registered with urban local body. So that user should be able to update the status of the service request. They should be able to go to the ground and then do the service online. And uh, when it comes to the FSTP operator, so the major problem on the ground is that whatever update that is received on the on from the households, it is not actually reaching the FSTP plant. So usually these operators just discard them, throw away in the stormwater drain, which is uh, which is unused, so that they don't have to travel all the way to the septic treatment plant and then discard this waste. Or in some cases, the infra itself is not there. In some cities, they don't have septic treatment plant, which is near to the cities or in the periphery of the city. And uh, so these are all the list of features that we have for the FSM version one. So now I'll just quickly get into the demo uh, of the FSM module. I see. I'm sure, sharing with yeah, yeah, sure. I'll just switch it off. Uh, meanwhile, if anyone has any queries, you can put them up in the QA box and we will take them up. Yeah. So this is the process flow where citizen starts and creates an application. That application is created, is validated by a sanitary inspector. If something is wrong, the inspector can reject the application. If everything is in order, the sanitary inspector can generate a demand for this application based on various parameters like uh, where the house is located, what is the distance of the house from the septic treatment plant, and uh, 
what if the if the road is narrow how do we arrive at the pricing strategy pricing for the request and uh, and also if if the household is present in the um, uh, what do you call uh, slum areas so based on the slum area there are congestion for the pricing that is that is uh, um, raised for this application request so based on these many parameters the sanitary inspector can raise the demand for the request so the demand is generated so the citizen can make a payment after making a payment the sanitary inspector would be allowed to assign a desalting operator to this particular citizen request and post the desalting operator can design on his, his his load of work he can either accept the request or he can reject the request if he is accepting he should he has to go to the ground he has to do the task on the ground and then say uh, request is completed and then he has to transport this request to the uh, sludge to the uh, septage treatment plant where the vehicle log and the volume of sludge uh, received at the FSTP plant they are updated by the plant operator and and also the desalting operator is like free to decline the request because you, you might have so many reasons right if the vehicle is not available is overloaded with work or it's rainy season is not operating so if it is declined then the uh, sanitary inspector can reassign the, this request to a different desalting operator who is available at that point of time so this is the overall process flow i'll just quickly go into one of our test servers and log in as a citizen to raise a request so this is our new ux for uh, digit and uh, apply for uh, emptying of septic tank perfect so as a citizen i am giving my mobile number since i am an i am an old user here it is not asking for my name because i am already registered this mobile number if you are a new user the first step will be after entering the otp it will ask for a name since my name is already present it will directly land to the application yeah so it talks about uh, it, it ask about what is the property type because the pricing also change uh, depends on the property type and sub type so if it is residential there is a different different pricing available if it is commercial there is a different pricing available and uh, and saying it is an independent house i want to be stretch okay so if location is turned on the map would come if i turn it on i need to refresh the page again for now i'm just skipping it i'm directly entering a pin code so this is a normal uh, this component which digit has which you already uh, might have in our so based on the pin code it is populating the locality and the city so it is asking is your property located in notified slum area if it is yes then as a citizen i need to specify from which slum uh, i am raising a request if it is no it would bypass the next question i'm saying yes so in the next step i i would need to select the slum in which i am raising a request this is from the master data then i can provide my street name and door number any landmark so this is an optional question so where we are trying to gather some data on the ground since the ulb does not have any information of what is the type of septic tank the citizen is having so we are trying to have some information here if the citizen doesn't know he can very well skip and continue after reading this all this information uh, all the supporting information for this particular question if we can uh, say that it is a uh, conventional septic tank he can like give the dimensions of it if he doesn't know the dimensions he can very well skip and continue so this is a summary page where i can change my information is required or i can submit the application so in a post submission there is a unique reference application which got generated so now i need to log in as an employee to process this request so remember that uh, we have different channels right either you can raise this online or you can uh, make a telephone call now as an employee to uh, create an application on his behalf or the citizen can walk into the counter and then the employee can access the create application page to raise this request all um, channels are available so now i'm logging out from citizen side logging in as an employee who can raise a demand and assign this uh, request to a particular dispatching operator
for some reason you are just slow very sorry it's loading yes yeah. just got another 5 minutes so this quickly run through the process Yeah, so now I'm sorting the application based on the date to get the latest one on top. Pfizer of is the latest one and you can see the status of the application in different statuses. So application created, pending for DSO approval, pending for payment. Um, so assume that there is a demand that is already generated. So as an employee, I'm logging in, I'm looking at the application. So everything is in order, I'm generating a demand for this application. So as of now, this generate demand is, uh, is a manual step because some human intelligence is required to understand what type of vehicle can go into those uh, roads, which is selected in the address. It can be even a narrow road or a wide road. If it is narrow road, uh, they should be able to send a vehicle which is smaller than a lorry, like a Mahindra Bullet pickup truck. So that's the reason. And the pricing is also depending on the type of vehicle which is reaching at the site. That's the reason there is a manual step here. If this is not, uh, if this decision point is not there, you can automatically generate a demand when it is in the submitting application. So it's a configurable parameter. Depending on the state needs, you can change this. And, uh, I'm updating the application and generating a demand. So now I can, uh, so I logged in as a counter operator as well. So for the, I'm just assume that citizen, is, citizen got the demand as an SMS, he walked into the counter, he made a payment and generated a receipt. Now, the next step is based on the process flow. After, after making a payment, the sanitary inspector has to assign this request to a particular dispatching operator after making a payment. So now I'm going back to the same request. The status will be pending for DSO assignment. Since the payment is made, I am assigning this request to my registered discharging operator. So this list is from the masters. I'm selecting one discharging operator. And by default, the vehicle capacity is already pre-populated because I know what vehicle this DSO is operating and what's the vehicle capacity. And there is an expected date of completion also. As a, an employee, based on the load of the discharging operator, I can say the vehicle will arrive at the citizen post of today or tomorrow or day after tomorrow. So based on this, there will be an SMS that is sent to the citizen saying that the vehicle will arrive at the doorstep in 48 hours. So that the citizen is informed that when the vehicle is, will be coming at this doorstep. So now uh, the citizen side is over. Uh, sorry, the employee side is over. Now we need to log in as a discharging operator, uh, ABC and DS services to whom the application request is assigned. And then he can assign, uh, he can either say, uh, accept the request or decline the request based on his workload. And also if it is accepting, if he is accepting, he or she is accepting the request, uh, he can assign the vehicle number to the request uh, to inform the citizen, citizen that the vehicle, uh, Mahindra Bolero truck, which number you want the X, Y, Z, will reach the citizen place on so-and-so date and time. So for this discharging operator, we can see 14 applications are pending for completion. That means that he has accepted 14 applications and 14 applications are in progress for it. And for 10 applications is assigned to the discharging operator, but he has not accepted it. So now I'm going to the inbox and going to the last one, 505, which we created now. If I am accepting the request, I need to uh, give the vehicle number that will go to the citizen's house. Yeah. 
Yeah. Taking an action, assign vehicle. I'll just take another one minute to finish it up. So I'm entering the vehicle number, assigning the vehicle. Vehicle assigned successfully. So now, so I am actually assuming that the DSO is actually going to the ground with this vehicle. And then once he does the uh, deslash the base from the house, he can say complete the request. So during this time, volume of base collected is a mandatory info where you need to enter what is the volume of base collected. By default, it is defaulting the uh, vehicle capacity which has taken to the ground. So, and we are, we are also allowing the user to modify this quantity if it is required. I'm just leaving the asset and then saying the status is completed. So now once so the septage is removed from the household, the next step is he has to transport the sludge to the desludging uh, FSP plant operator. So now assume that uh, the DSO has taken this waste to the FSP plant. Now the plant operator logs in, he, he updates the vehicle log for the vehicle number 5959 saying that 5959 has entered the plant on so and so date and time and they have desludged 1000 liters of septage um, at the plant and then he saves this information so that the cycle gets completed. Yeah. This is the last step, another 20 seconds. I'm logging in as a plant operator. So it says ready for disposal, 1000, one kiloliter, that is 1000 liters. So which is nothing but the transaction which we created now. So if it, is, if it contains multiple vehicles that is pending for disposal, you will see an array of vehicles that is present in this view. So now you can see vehicle number 5959 is ready for disposal, which has come from ABC and DO services. And total waste collected is 1000 liters. Now I can update the vehicle log for this transaction. I can say what is the vehicle entry time. And waste received as there is some issue here, it should, it should actually 1000. It's a test server. And I can say what is the vehicle out time. And also, he has a knowledge of from where this vehicle, uh, um, the septage was collected. It says it's an independent house, and this is an application with reference. And he submit the vehicle log is updated successfully. And he has got lots of reports to view the information of how many transactions per day and all those stuff. So this is the entire process chain. So we started from the citizen, created an application, went to the employee, generated the demand. Post payment, as in the dispatching operator, operator went to the ground, he, trans he processed the request. Then the subtage is uh, sent to the treatment plan for further processing. This is the end-to-end flow for the uh, clicker search management module. If you have any other clarifications, we can talk or we can proceed. Thank you. There are a couple of questions, Shankar, and thank you for this. This was very succinct. So, yeah. do you want to take them up in the Q&A box? Sure. If a strip you operate or employee is receiving. Um, he is an employee. FSTP operator is an employee. At which state of work can um, Yeah, as I as I showed you, once a desludging operator uh, removes the sludge from the household and takes to the plant, at that time the FSTP operator can log the uh, vehicle logs. Provide link file localization script for FS. Um, I didn't get the second question, Prasun Kumar. You are asking whether localization keys are available for FSM in English and MD. Is it? So we have a localization um, done in the digit UX for Hindi language. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Sankar. Uh, yeah. I am looking for uh, the EN localization script uh, for FSM. Like uh, I couldn't find in the documentation, so. Okay, I think Satish P can answer this question when, when he is coming into uh, discussion later in this call. But if he's, if he's available now, he can answer Satish. What's Shankar? No, he is asking something on EN localization script. Oh, that will be, that is already released as part of the release. 
uh, I think uh, Ajay, we have shared the release communication with external people, right? Or are we going to yeah. share this uh, webinar? It's part of the, I mean, it has been shared and even the emailer which you saw as part of the webinar, the release communication is there and we can actually go to the uh, docs website as well. It will have, it has a section on the left called release notes. Yeah, and release notes will have the same Yes, so the link yeah. has been given for a git, uh, the, all the localization scripts, including English and Hindi, everything is given in that uh, link. So in the release notes itself. There's a link okay, so, to sure. the scripture. I'll share it. Give me one second. Yeah. I'll also put it in the chat window. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no further questions. I think we can move. Uh, so we can to the go to the questions and answer maybe at the end. Uh, we have a separate session, right? I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this makes sense because this was related to sanitation. So uh, moving on, Ajit, you want to take them through each other? I just hear on mute if you're talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm here. Just a second. Uh, Ajay. Yeah, so Ajay, can you guys see my screen? It's visible. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ajit. I'm a product manager with e governments Foundation. Uh, I work on multiple revenue products like uh, property tax, uh, M Collect. M Collect is one of the products and that I will be doing demo for. Uh, so uh, a little brief about mCollect. Uh, it's a product that we have designed to capture all the miscellaneous collections that happen in the ULB. So uh, in uh, in the urban local domain, there are like 70 odd services for uh, for which ULB, uh, corporations basically charge money uh, or levy some sort of tax on the citizens and to streamline the collection and the payment process of these services, we came up with this product. So now in the V2 version of mCollect, we have extended the uh, mCollect features uh, to the citizens. Also, we have provided uh, uh, the edit and cancel Chalan facility. So some of the key features of mChalan are now uh, M, uh, there are some features available for the citizen, like they can search their Chalan. So once a Chalan is generated, it will trigger a notification to the citizen. So uh, with the Chalan number, so a citizen can log in into uh, in uh, onto the digit platform and then search their Chalan using their mobile number, the Chalan number. Then second is pay for the service using payment link. Uh, payment link uh, in the notification that is triggered to the citizen on the registered mobile number, we share a payment link. Clicking on the payment link, uh, citizen will be prompted to the is it a website where they can uh, make online payment using their credit and debit card payment using QR code. So uh, right uh, now that we are generating uh, each challenge, we can basically print those chalan and ULBs can send these uh, send these physical copies through post or on field distribution. These copies have QR code and that those QR codes can be uh, scanned and uh, citizens can make online payments uh, scanning those QR codes. So one of the key things here is these are open QR, co QR codes. These are not specific to any one particular payment channel like Google Pay or something like that. These, uh, these QR codes redirect uh, citizen to the digit website where they can log in and make the payment. On the ULP side, uh, we already had a collection of uh, all the miscellaneous services through mCollect. Now, uh, employees can basically edit or cancel Chalan uh, that are generated for the miscellaneous services. So what used to happen, uh, there were cases where, where there were some uh, errors in, the, in capturing the contact details or uh, basically the tax amount. And in that case, employees had to basically generate a new chalan altogether and that chalan, previous chalan will sit in the system forever as a pending uh, demand. So, but now uh, employees can basically edit the chalans uh, to the new details or cancel the chalans and generate a new chalan. Also, we have updated dashboards and reports for uh, each chalan. 
uh, to give administrators uh, a view of what uh, collection patterns are there on the ground, how much uh, collection is there uh, about the employee performance, how much a particular employee is collecting. Uh, in terms of multi multi channel access, uh, this particular product is mobile first. Uh, although it can be used on tablet and uh, tablet and desktop, but uh, the way the product is designed, it's mobile first. Minimal information has been asked. So also uh, this M Collect facility can be extended to uh, the CSC counters and the field level employees. So I'll I'll get to the demo without any. A second. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the employee login interface. Uh, we have a facility to uh, select the uh, language. Hindi and English are two options that we have provided right now. I'll go ahead with English. So here I will enter the employee login credentials. On employee side, uh, as most of you have seen, we have a username and password based login. On the citizen side, we primarily have OTP based login. So clicking on login. So this is the landing page for the employee. Uh, for this particular employee, uh, we have assigned three roles. One is finance, HRMS, and then there is M Collect. So uh, I'll click on M Collect. This is the landing page uh, for the employee when they cl uh, click on M Collect. Uh, the landing page is new collection. And this is also the major use case uh, for the employees while they, they are using M Collect. Most of the time, they have to generate new salon and uh, then collect payment against that salon. So uh, chronologically, this is how it happens. They generate a salon and then there itself, they collect the payment. So I'll enter in consumer name, I'll enter my name, my mobile number. And then we are capturing the address of the consumer. The address of the consumer is being captured uh, only because uh, the challenge are uh, most of the times sent to the uh, employees uh, to the citizens on the ground. So when uh, employees are uh, basically generating the challenge from some some register details, then they have to the citizen citizens house. Then in service detail, we have to capture admin. So let's say. One then there is billing date. Uh, so this is an open field uh, from to two date. Uh, it can be a future date. It can be a past date. This is completely up to the discretion of the employee. Then tax amount, it can, it's like 4,000 and then field fee. So these tax heads basically tax amount, field fee, then some of the ULBs on, on some services that are CGST and SGST. So these are basically completely, uh, these are completely configurable uh, as per ULB's requirements. So clicking on generate Chalan. So, Salon has been generated successfully. Uh, it's as simple as that. It's a single page application in terms of generating the Chalan. And now once the Chalan is generated, our notification is, has been sent to the citizen uh, with the Chalan number, uh, basically, and uh, a link to make payment. So now I can basically uh, copy this consumer number and go back to the home page. I want just to show like how it. Placement fee. 
I can use yeah so this is basically the chalan that I have generated right now you can see this is a clickable link and the status of the chalan is active so if I click on this uh, on the link it shows the tax amount uh, status of the chalan and then service detail for which the chalan has to be paid So clicking on pay, I get to the payment page. So on payment payment page, there is capture payment uh, like cash, check, credit card. So they, these are basically multiple payment instruments that can be used to make the payment. And uh, basically credit and debit card, there is no POS integration right now, but uh, if they have a POS machine, then they can basically uh, capture payment using the credit debit card and then enter details here. So most of the cases, the primary instrument that they use is cash and then clicking on generate receipt. So uh, against that particular chalan number, we have captured, a, uh, captured the payment and generated the receipt. Again, once the, uh, once the payment is captured, it again triggers a notification with a link to download the receipt to the citizen. Again, with search chalan, uh, I can search the chalan here using my mobile number. We on the active chalan. So uh, there are two options here, cancel and update. So uh, this, this is a spelling mistake basically. Cancel and update. So if I click on update, then it will take me to the update screen. If I click on cancel, it will take me, uh, it will basically ask the reason to cancel the challenge. So once I'll cancel the challenge and then, uh, update the challenge, and then in the next flow, we will uh, try and cancel the challenge. So when I click on update, uh, all the challenge details are already populated here. Uh, so some of the details cannot be changed, like mobile number uh, and street name, all uh, the consumer details. But the details that can be changed are around service category. Uh, and the uh, tax details. So these details can actually be changed. So if I uh, select, let's say 59,900 and then click on update. So this successfully updates the salon. And if I click on pay, uh, it will show like, okay, this is the new updated amount and I can make the payment. Also against the same salon, if I go back to the home page, the salon uh, basically, against this particular chalan. So right now the total amount is 59,900, uh, but there is some error in, let's say, in the consumer details, like in mobile number, and consumer wants to basically uh, generate a new chalan. So they can ask the employee to generate a new chalan and cancel the previous one. So clicking on cancel the chalan, it will ask for uh, basically reason for cancel, uh, You know, yes. So as simple as that, the chalan has been cancelled and again, a notification will be triggered to the citizen like your chalan has been cancelled and go to home. Basically, now they can provide fresh details and generate a new chalan. So these are the key features basically uh, of edit and yeah. So uh, these are the key features in the new release where we are providing edit or cancel chalan, generating new chalan. Uh, also, on the uh, citizen side, they uh, can primarily use their mobile to basically click on the link and make the payment. It's the online payment. So, uh, uh, I will share the credentials uh, with Ajay. He can share it with you all, and you can use uh, the feature of basically scanning the QR code and making 
uh, payment use, using the payment link uh, or using your mobile number. So that's it from my side, uh, basically. Perfect. Thank you, Ajit, for this. I do see there's a question on FSM. Franka, we will answer it later in the call if you, that's okay. Uh, meanwhile, I'll give it off to Satish to, so we've had a couple of product demos, which have talked about the new product launches as part of Digit. Now we will shift the gears to talk about the platform changes that we are rolling out. Uh, these are focused around the QA automation piece and uh, the security testing that we are doing. So we have started uh, internal security testing and we will be rolling it out as part of the next as well. So Satish, do uh, you want to pick this up and talk about it more? Yeah, uh, thanks uh, Ajay. So uh, in 2.4, what we have done is uh, from last three months, we are working on platform security fixes. So we have hired one of our uh, uh, on the outside uh, the partners basically to get the security audit done uh, where they are expert in uh, cyber security. So they have done a couple of rounds of security audit to our entire platform, all the services, including UIs, uh, code, scanning, everything. And they are given the list of vulnerabilities and we have fixed them. And also as part of this, uh, we have come up with a documentation and best practices. We're uh, ongoing, we have to make sure that uh, whether we are writing the code from the platform side, our partners are writing it. We have to make sure that we are uh, sticking to those guidelines so that there are no security loopholes will be there. Uh, our colleagues like uh, Aniket and Jagan, uh, they'll present uh, what are the security fixes and guidelines and best practices uh, we are uh, proposing and we have, we have published this document as part of 2.4 release as well. Uh, over to you, Aniket. Yeah, uh, thanks, Atish. So uh, as Satish mentioned, uh, uh, we had a, a, a security audit of our platform. And as part of uh, Digit 2.4 release, we have uh, fixed like majority of the uh, security vulnerabilities uh, uh, pointed out by the audit team. So basically, from, from that exercise, we actually uh, have come up with a security guideline handbook. So where we have like uh, wrote the uh, do's and don'ts like from our learning experience. So uh, basically, uh, first we have a, a list of uh, best practices which, which should be followed during uh, designing and uh, writing of the uh, code. And then uh, we have a detailed guidelines uh, where uh, which should be taken into consideration before app development or uh, designing of the uh, application flow. So uh, I will just uh, quickly give an overview of uh, uh, the best practices and uh, we can then just uh, see how they apply for uh, these issues. So uh, the first one is your uh, basic POJO. So we should always uh, like add size validations and regex validation on all input fields uh, because like suppose we don't add size validations, right? Then in case of uh, our platform where we uh, store non-transactional non data in a asynchronous manner, right? In persister. So it will go and fail in persister while uh, this uh, uh, UI will receive a 200. That data will be anyway there in the data topic, but as a uh, good practice, we should always uh, reject those uh, requests at the API level itself. Okay, and then on top of that, for all the uh, open text fields, right, uh, like comments and such, we should have uh, this at the rate safe HTML uh, annotation of Hibernate, or we should build our own custom annotation uh, which should block any HTML code, uh, which can be sent by a malicious user in the system. So basically we should validate every string field if it contains any script tag or any other HTML code. So that's like basic uh, validations on the class level. After that, uh, we have a series of validations on the file that gets uploaded into the system. So the first one is we rename all the files that are stored in our system. So basically, this is one of the uh, best practices uh, given by uh, according to OVAPS. So uh, what what it does is like if we means if we don't rename the files, there 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 is a chance that user uh, adds a malicious uh, malicious file name and then uploads it. And uh, depending on the fi file name, we 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 might store it in some uh, different folder than in uh, than intended. So basically, it's important that we rename all the files before storing them. Then uh, 
another another practice is like we shouldn't ever store a file in our uh, sir uh, means main server itself in the application folder because if by if somehow uh, it breaches and gets into our system it shouldn't have access to the uh, to to our kernel to the, uh, means it shouldn't be able to execute a shell script or any other script uh, on the kernel so basically we use um, uh, aid of this bucket so uh, yeah we should avoid like storing it directly in application folder then next is uh, depending on our use case we should uh, whitelist certain file extensions only like suppose uh, we are uploading documents right so we shouldn't allow .sh or like those shell script extensions uh, to be uploaded so uh, only the required ones uh, before and based on the business requirement we should whitelist uh, the file uh, file extension this is anyway configurable uh, configurable in uh, our digit uh, platform and the last thing to do is like we have to validate that the data given in the file is same as the extension it means it's, it shouldn't be like someone is uh, uh, writing a uh, shell script and then just using dot jpg extension and trying to upload it so we should validate the content as well so that can be done using libraries like apache uh, tika so anyway if uh, you are directly using a uh, file store or uh, a service of uh, a digit platform it it has already taken care of this thing but if you are uh, implementing custom one then you'll have to take care of uh, this points then uh, next is uh, apis so basically for uh, AP, api related uh, we have seen like we have to do rate throttling so all the uh, uh, all all the underscore underscore create api should have some sort of rate throttling otherwise uh, say for example uh, you have your uh, pgr service right a public driven service so a citizen can just write a loop and keep generating request in our system so basically, basically we should uh, throttle uh, all such things so basically uh, rate limiting is very important for that and after that for underscore search apis we should have uh, we should have a pagination as mandatory uh, because uh, as the system uh, uh, over over the time lot of data get generated in the system so uh, some apis might uh, some search parameters might return lot of data so we don't want to write uh, run in like java if hip space error or something like that which can crash the port so we should always make sure that all of our search apis are paginated then after that uh, before whitelisting actually we should be like very careful whatever apis we are whitelisting they should have first of all ip based uh, uh, rate throttling and then uh, we should see if it's it's absolutely required uh, to whitelist the api uh, so suppose like in case uh, if someone wants to update a calculation right uh, on the, uh, uh, update the calculation they shouldn't directly call update means they shouldn't like try to directly call underscore update a uh, demand or some apis uh, which are like which should be always be behind our uh, business uh, services so uh, basically we should like overall we should be very, very careful about whitelisting so uh, yeah and in case of uh, uh, sending parameters in query params we shouldn't uh, we should not send any sensitive information in a query params Uh, instead we should send it in body or in header so in our previous versions we were sending the auth token uh, in the logout api as a query param now we have moved it to body so uh, if in your code anywhere you are uh, uh, sending any uh, sensitive information in param that should be just uh, changed and uh, send in a body or in a header so apart from that uh, we have compiled a list of uh, coding practices uh, uh, good coding practices so basically uh, we have the error handling so the error handling should be proper and we shouldn't like uh, throw complete stack trace to the ui and someone can figure out like if 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 there is a problem with query formation or something we just should throw a custom exception it shouldn't happen like the whole stack trace is going to the end user okay and uh, then where, whenever we are using a hashing algorithm we should make sure like we are using something like sha2 instead of sha1 because someone can try to uh, like brute force using sha1 and um, like he can get a collision right and uh, able to match a password or something like that so basically we should always uh, prefer sha uh, sha256 and then we have a bunch of other uh, uh, according practices like you should always check for sql injection like 
everywhere uh, you should use uh, uh, prepared statements. Then whenever you have while loops, uh, make sure that you, you are not using user inputs. Uh, then in, in case of logging, you shouldn't ever uh, print any sensitive information like passwords or odd tokens. So yeah, uh, certain we have this list of coding practices. So uh, to summarize uh, this detailed guidelines, uh, we can summarize the security vulnerabilities into like four categories. I can say uh, first is like this brute slash uh, DDoS attacks, which can be throttled, means which can be handled by rate throttling and account locking mecha mechanisms. Then we have a bunch of uh, security vulnerabilities because of uh, in improper input validation. So uh, there will be like HTTP parameter uh, pollution, then CRLF attacks. So a lot of attacks can take place if we don't uh, validate the inputs uh, strictly. So uh, uh, that's a second type of vulnerabilities. Then the third type is uh, due to configuration. Uh, so uh, 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 there, there can be vulnerabilities like privilege escalation or improper uh, cookie settings. So uh, we have to make sure that like, whatever the role mappings we are doing uh, uh, in our MDMS or whatever the workflow configurations we are having uh, that are proper and we are not uh, giving uh, some API uh, access to some uh, specific role which never uh, going to use it. And in case of citizen, uh, we should be extra careful uh, because uh, apart from role based, you might have, you might want to do like user based validation in that case. So that uh, validation should be added at the business level because access control will do only role based validation. Yeah. So uh, uh, that is like a config configuration based vulner vulnerabilities. And then you have the last ones that are the coding based. So it depends on how how you have code, uh, coded the application. So you should always use the most of, I mean, latest version of the libraries, uh, the dependencies which you are using, then you, uh, you should take care, I mean, you should check for your logging, like you're not logging any sensitive data. Then uh, even if you're uh, like opening certain input streams, that should be always closed in finally statements. And then there are uh, functions which should be avoided. In case of UI, you can select eval function should be always avoid, avoided in JavaScript. Uh, so uh, like there are this list of uh, best practices which we have uh, compiled here. So uh, yeah, I guess like I can't go in detail because of time constraint in each security. Yeah, Aniket, what we can do is let them go through. If they have any questions, uh, maybe uh, even offline also uh, we can answer. Yeah. yeah. Because we are given all the information here. So because of a time constraint, I don't think so we can go through one by one. There are a lot of things are there. Yeah, yeah. it is exhaustive so, documentation. Yeah, we can have a separate session only for uh, security vulnerabilities if required. Maybe one question you can answer, uh, Niket, that one question is there, what rate limiting technical algorithm do you use for API rate limiting? That you can answer now. Maybe, or uh, you can answer uh, in the okay, chat. Okay, okay, so basically, uh, uh, there is there is this libra, uh, li uh, library by uh, Mac Boros, I guess, uh, in Zool. Uh, we have done a custom uh, means by default it provides like origin based uh, uh, your origin based address based based rate limiting. We have customized it to provide a UUID based. So basically, we check uh, the UUID from the user info instead of the request info. And based on that UID based, we provide uh, rate limiting. So we have custom, we have done custom implementation of that library uh, to provide that functionality. But for whitelisted APIs where there is no uh, UUID, we use the origin based uh, rate throttle. Uh, this it answer the question. I think thanks, Aniket. Thanks a lot. I think we can move on to the next session. Ajay, we can move on to the next session, right? Q automation demo. Sure. Before that, uh, so just sir, uh, all of the documentation that we have, we put on docs, and I think I've put the link to the security guidelines handbook of docs in the chat window as well. So all the exhaustive doc. So this is internally what we use, and all of this is anyways put out on the docs website. So from a documentation point of view, you can refer to docs for anything that we have created, and it's similar. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, one of the core reasons why we initiated this feature was because a lot of uh, partners who are implementing Widget obviously have to look at uh, security testing or security audit for their instance as well. So this helps give them confidence in terms of what 
we are using has already been vetted by audits that we do uh, on a regular basis. At the same time, even when you're contributing back to Digit, which is something which is happening more often, uh, we vet for uh, the code. And this is what we look for besides uh, the general practices, which we've already seated out on the docs website. Hence, I think secure uh, testing, guide, uh, testing guidelines is a pivotal piece, which when any partner is either implementing Digit or extending Digit, uh, will become crucial for them. So I'll let Satish take over to talk about your automation. Okay, thanks, Ajay. Uh, so, uh, so in related to QA automation, what we have done is uh, we are doing a complete automation of all the backend APIs, end-to-end -end automation of backend APIs, and as well as currently we are working on even UI automation. We thought that will be useful for sharing ETL so that uh, even implementation partners, uh, any code changes or uh, if they want to do a regression testing of the modules, they can make use of this API automation and they can run it in their implementation locally and then make sure that the APIs are not breaking if they're making any changes in the API level. So our one of our colleague, uh, Samai, will walk you through the demo of QR automation, whatever you've done, and uh, it'll showcase what kind of report will generate it and what is the, uh, how we can use uh, from the implementation point of view the all these automation scripts. Samai, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Satish. So I will be sharing my screen quickly. Yeah, and so as uh, uh, Satish mentioned, like uh, we need uh, automation uh, for uh, making sure like each each implementation of this product is uh, bug free and the partners don't face any issues while deploying or like and the end users are also can also use the application without any uh, major bugs. So yeah, uh, so the main reason for doing the API here instead of the uh, UI was like, um, like targeting the API first was making sure like all the services core, like um, the backend part is working fine. And as it is a uh, um, application com consisting of multiple uh, services, um, uh, it, it has been a huge task to create a, uh, create a, uh, scripts and making sure like um, the new development on the backend side is not breaking any of the functionalities uh, in the new new developments here. So what we use for the QA automation is uh, a framework called Karate. So Karate is basically a API automation specific framework. Like it was earlier used for the API itself. Now they have come with the UI as well. So and, and now, uh, it uses uh, the hiking syntax, so it is very basically easy to use, easy to read, and uh, it consists of uh, given when then kind of syntax. So if you see a given when and then, so it makes sure like uh, uh, there is a precondition and there are some actions, and then uh, the uh, verifications or assertions are complete, um, completely written over here. So if I uh, go through the flow quickly, uh, so what we do is like while running the script, we provide two things in uh, that is a config file, which consists of various um, uh, configurations like URL and the uh, uh, IDs, um, username, password, credentials, and all. And then there comes the tags, like what kind of tag we use. So if you have gone to the release notes, we have come up with various kinds of services, automation, like billing service, collection service, and all these things. Um, and, uh, and to run specific services, we need to make sure like uh, there are, uh, we have this documentation in which we have mentioned the tags over here. So for to run any of the services, what we need to uh, do is like, we just need to know the tag which is required for that and a config file, which consists of um, various uh, uh, credentials. Like, so if you can see over here, it's your.ml, so it consists of host, this local host and mock host are basically used for Kafka-based services, uh, state code, city code. So if just these things are required to be configured along with the username and password uh, to run this uh, script across various partners and implementations. Uh, so I would be just give, trying to run one of the test cases over here. So as you can see over here, uh, what I'm providing is uh, this QA ML file path. So that is basically the path of our config file along with the tag which you want to run. So I'm currently looking to run for fire and service. So I just picked any of the tag out of this uh, 
uh, this list and uh, choose this file in scene. So I will run this. So there are some prerequisites which uh, which uh, which are required, like getting the authentication token for all the users, which are required for this automation script to run, and then using the that um, tokens for a uh, few of our um, uh, prerequisites, like uh, uh, getting data from the MDMS or so maybe, maybe you can how we are passing this input data. So because client to client environment, it might change, right? So yeah. Uh, so uh, this input data is basically uh, fetched from uh, the um, MDMS core, most 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 of the data. But if we if we are passing some hardcore data like uh, uh, validation for uh, error messages or something like that, it has been mentioned in the uh, constants file over here. So as, if you can see, and like we have mentioned all the uh, constants in here, like document type. Uh, which is required, or the actions which are which goes there, or the error messages which we expect when we pass some invalid uh, current uh, invalid uh, data in the body. Um, um, so uh, this con this uh, this are basically written in the con uh, YAML files in the constants folder, and uh, and this is the QA.yaml which consists of configurations. So whatever this QA.ML which is shown here, basically it is uh, environment to environment, it can vary. For example, if you have UIT.ML, you can write your own UIT.ML. For example, if you have something like UKD.ML where you want to run on the UKD instance, uh, you can write the configuration like that. What are the input input configurations, URL, the data, city, details, all those things. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, test uh, scripts are run over here. Uh, there are 26 scenarios which are run out of which 25 pass, one is failed. So if we want to see the results, we um, there are two ways which we can do is like one is going through this um, reports, which I mentioned over here. So as you can see, like we ran only one feature that is fire NOC, and it consisted of 26 uh, total um, scenarios out of which one failed and 25 passed. So if you want to debug like which one failed, uh, we can easily go through here, uh, check that verify searching for fire NOC service without the parameters. So uh, this is basically ex uh, expecting to get 200, but uh, uh, currently, it is giving some other uh, status score, so that is failing. So it is basically it should fail because it should be giving some. If you are not passing anything, it should be giving some errors. So, uh, and we have one more. So this is basically a bit detailed form of view. Like if you want to go through each and every step, we can use this kind of uh, reporting, and we also provide one more report that is this Kakumba level report. So it gives us an overview of the whole run. So as you can see, like it shows 25 passed, one fails, 193 total steps were executed while running 25 scenarios. And let's give me one second, please. I need to get the new. Oh, Samay, and also you can mention about the Jenkins integration. If you want to run for the entire suite, you can use Jenkins setup and then you can run that as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so this is one of the way which I showed like, and as Satish mentioned, we have one more, one more way to run this is in Jenkins. So for that, uh, just give me one second. I think it builds that uh, digital to Yeah, 
so we have to kind of just explain it what we can do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah so uh, here uh, we have two kind of things one api is one one is a uh, ui so these jobs are basically ready for api and ui respectively and if we want to run any of the uh, uh, tags which were mentioned earlier so as i mentioned like we have two different kind of inputs which we require one is a config file other is a tag file Uh, like tags which you want so here we can choose the config file which you want to run and here we can just input the tag which you want to run and then uh, it will run and it will give us a report over here that's it oh. yeah so it's like that's pretty much from the automation Basically, side for this also we have written a documentation uh, and which is having read me and all the documentation that uh, you can show that qa automation documentation which were released as part of this Yeah. So you, there's a readme also there in detail, and also there's a QA automation uh, documentation as well, which is uh, link is given as part of the release notes. So the details are mentioned here. Here also the link to readme also given. Even the uh, code base, everything is given, including the test cases as well. Uh, so whatever even uh, the the framework documentation also mentioned here. So you can go through that, and you can come back if there are any questions. So with this, uh, uh, I think Ajay, we can move to move on to question and answer session. I think we're done with uh, today's agenda. Awesome. Thank so, you. yeah, you can pick up the few questions. And sorry, I've sent the wrong link on QR automation. I'll send the proper link again. Give me one second. Meanwhile, you can pick up the questions. Sorry. Uh, we have one question. I have FSM front end set up locally, but I am not getting the login page for employee. Uh, I don't think so. We can answer here. Uh, the reason is we need to see what kind of is there any any configuration issues or any dependency issues, right? So it is more of a local setup. So the guidelines are being given in the documentation in the readme uh, in the UI setup. Uh, but again, uh, we need to see the system what kind of error it is throwing. Accordingly, we can suggest it. So Jagan, you want to answer anything here? Yeah, I'm assuming. Form. Just one second. I'm assuming this query has already been flagged. So I think in one of the emails, if I'm not wrong. So if that is the case, yes, we will revert on that. But otherwise, yeah, we can give our comments right now. Yeah, if you uh, Jagan, if you want to give any high level comments, you can give other than whatever I explain. Yeah, first of all, uh, yeah, digit and uh, user. It takes a citizen page only. If you want to run it as an employee, we'll have to set the tenure roman to employee, and then only we'll be allowed to restart the server so that you'll be able to see all the employee screens. So basically, we have two builds, right? Employee and citizen. Yeah. Yeah. In UI, anyway, we have only one. Yeah. It is based on that user type. It behaves for both citizen and employee. But. Uh... in the earlier version we have not released uh, any the employee login right so usually we are using a coexistence so they have to run the old front end app as well right uh, jagan uh in that case only uh, they have to just set that employee as a user type and then auth token in that home screen itself so that it doesn't ask for the login credentials again Okay. They can proceed with the local development. In case of uh, deployment, so yeah, it will be like uh, it will be handled from the old UI. Okay. Okay. Thanks, sir. Next question is: Do we need to migrate the services to later version to check the QA reports? Yes. Right now, uh, the whatever the test cases uh, return uh, and as well automation is done based on the 2.4. If there are no changes in the APIs, so mostly the core and uh, business services even many municipal services there are no changes in the api contract if that is a case still we can run the qa automation uh, if something failing means there are some updates which are done in the latest uh, uh, release so the automation is based on that latest release so this is the base release we are released based on the 2.4 uh, but again uh, it should work at least 80% of the use cases yeah uh, if there are failures that means uh, the latest code has been not taken so there are might be some changes in that yeah. okay there are any questions yeah we have few more here um, do we need to oh, this is already there added right? okay. uh, i think we don't have any other questions if any other questions we can take it up ajay Yeah, I mean, we'll just give everyone thirty seconds. If there are any queries, you can also raise your hand up. 
Yeah, you want to ask the question directly? Meanwhile, completely forgot about this. I'm just going to launch a poll. So it would be really helpful if you can let us know if the session, session, wow, why am I messing my words up? Session was useful. And so we will be sharing the recording of the webinar as well. Given that this had both contributions from 2.3 and 2.4, uh, I think this will be especially useful for most of the audience. So let us know how you found the session. And if you have any specific feedback on the webinar itself and our release note, which we send out to the partners, I'm just going to put my email ID here and you can write directly to me and we can see if we can accommodate your changes. And also you can give feedback on the documentation as well. So whatever you publish the, in the git book as well as docs.digit.org. If you feel that if something is missing, if you're trying it out, uh, please give us the feedback. Uh, we'll try to improve the quality of our documentation as well. Yep, we love feedback. So any feedback on the session, on the documentation, on our product itself. So you've seen the FSM product in each alarm, the way that they've been built. And if you have any comments in terms of how they should be done differently, please let us know. We'll be happy to answer you in any way. So I put down my email ID here. Uh, I think there is one question. When will we update this section? Can you answer this? Sabish, there's a one question open. Yeah, checking, checking, one minute. Sure. Uh, when will update this section? Configuring in props. Uh, I think this, uh, Gajan, we need to take it to Gajendran. Uh. So I know we are doing an exercise right now to ease infra setup for one instance, and that documentation ideally will be out in another week. So I, infra configuration section, yeah. I mean, so you will see, uh, I think better documentation on that, and I can share that across with you as well. So remind me if I forget, and I will share that across. Give us a week to 10 days, and this will be specific for, I think, setting up one module of digit. So that it becomes easier for everyone to refer just one document rather than going through multiple documents. So we are making a lot of changes on the documentation as well. And as, as we said, if you think there are any documents which need to be updated, or you think there is any feedback for us, you think that the documentation is hard to navigate, let us know, we'll fix it up and ensure that you get the right documentation. Perfect. I think we're good in time and the session looks like was very useful. So thank you everyone for participating in this. We hope that the improvements in 2.3 and 2.4 are going to be very fruitful to you and you're going to be using this on a regular basis. And if there are any queries, questions, anything that you want to let us know, do reach out to us and, be, and we'll be happy to answer them as and when we can. And thank you team for presenting and showcasing your work. And this was super useful. So I'll send across the video for this as well. And um, thank you everyone for attending. Have a nice weekend. Take Thanks, care. Ajay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.